Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Transportation in Massachusetts, Emerging from the Pandemic. I'm Mary McGuire, Director of Public and Government Affairs at AAA Northeast, and I'd like to welcome our audience and our esteemed speakers here today for what I know will be an informative and lively discussion. Many of us, healthcare workers, first responders, and many more, have been on the front lines during the pandemic, but many of us have also been hunkered down at home, and that's about to change in a big way. Over the next year, as more of us become vaccinated, we'll see a surge in mobility and transportation issues touch all of us, whether we walk, ride a bike, a bus or a ferry, use commuter rail or transit. Transportation is a huge economic driver. The American Rescue Plan Act is bringing big dollars to the Commonwealth. Transportation equity is a key issue and a huge federal infrastructure bill seems to be taking shape in Washington, D.C. So we have a lot to talk about this afternoon and with us today to discuss the changing landscape of mobility and transportation in the Commonwealth post pandemic are three public officials who have devoted much of their working lives to these issues. Chairman Bill Strauss represents the 10th Bristol District, has served in the legislature since 1993 and has been House co-chair of the Joint Committee on Transportation for more than a decade now. Chairman Strauss's Senate co-chair, Joe Boncori, had also planned to join us today, but was called away on another matter about an hour ago. Tom McGee has been mayor of Lynn since 2018 and co-chairs the Commuter Rail Communities Coalition. Prior to that, Mayor McGee served in the state legislature for 23 years and was Senate co-chair of the Joint Committee on Transportation from 2011 to 2017. Stephen Bedore is also a former Senate co-chair of the Joint Committee on Transportation, serving in the legislature for 10 years from 2002 to 2012. He is now Senior Vice President of Government Relations at ML Strategies. So welcome to all of you and thank you for being here. It's great to see you. I'd like to first give each of you a few minutes to talk about a couple of issues that are important to you in the transportation realm. And then I'm going to open the conversation up for you to jump in as you wish and invite our audience to ask questions as well as press. This webinar is being recorded. So Chairman Strauss, let's begin with you. And I'd like to start with some breaking news. As we speak, the MBTA Fiscal Control Board is meeting to discuss restoration of cuts to the T and those who depend on transit rallied at noon at the transportation building. We saw an outcry over the service cuts from our congressional delegation. What are your thoughts on the future of the MBTA as we emerge from the pandemic and what can users of the system who really depend on it expect? Thank you and uh, thanks to the AAA for hosting us today. It's a pleasure to be here and certainly with two of my uh, former colleagues in, in the legislature. Uh, we, uh, we like to make fun of House and Senate rivalries but in fact uh, we all have very good working relationships uh, when I serve with each of these guys and uh, and that's true of the institution and uh, it's certainly true with my current co-chair Senator Bon Corey uh, so uh, that said uh, to your your question about the tea and we'll get into lots of other stuff <clears throat> I think uh, I always like to view MBTA issues in in two respects one is the operating budget and that's the focus today that is uh, what's the level of services? What's the schedule being provided on the different modes that the T operates in? Buses, subways, commuter rail, and and uh, and ferries. But the other half of it is the capital budget, which is uh, how do we take care of the equipment uh, and uh, not just what's there, but uh, in terms of expansions. And with regard to the service levels, what was happening Maybe last summer it made some sense for the T to be planning on a reduced level of uh, services and schedule because uh, no one really knew what was ahead. We still in many respects don't. Uh, but uh, we had federal monies on hand from the CARES Act. We didn't know whether there would be further assistance. We're very fortunate that Congress and President Biden have provided this new uh, further relief uh, in the Recovery Act. And so that has allowed the T, I'm happy to say, and I expect, uh, to think in terms of uh, not doing the cutbacks. But I'm hoping or expecting they'll do it in a targeted way where we are seeing uh, growth and also a sustained level because of the workforce that everyone depends on are on uh, buses and, and to some degree subways. And that certainly should be first in line, those two modes 
for uh, taking care of services and schedules. Commuter rail is a tough one uh, because it was hit the hardest, uh, hit first, and everyone expects it to see passenger levels uh, coming back uh, slower. And uh, given what we're seeing on the roadways now in terms of traffic, what used to be called commuting traffic, uh, a lot of those people are on the roads so that uh, statewide we're really 90% uh, of the traffic levels we were, but, but not in the Boston corridor. Boston Turnpike, uh, uh, Mass Turnpike and the Boston Extension still down like 40%. So, uh, so I think the T has the money. Uh, they'll also be able today from the documents I've seen to do something that I think was was not good, which was they were trying to book uh, uh, CARES Act money to cover for their capital budget. And that's something I hope we get into, which is the capital budget, that other half I, I previewed, that's still got huge in excess of $10 billion needs to get to a state of good repair on the capital side of what we think of in terms of mass transit in eastern Massachusetts. And uh, fortunately, uh, with the federal money that's come in, we're going to be able to uh, get that money back into the capital budget, but also now have the debate that we started to have last session and will this one in terms of the revenue for the long term transportation system, mass transit and the roads. Thanks. So what do you hope will come out of today's meeting, Chairman Krauss? Well, that, that, that people who were looking at cutbacks in terms of service levels and schedules, particularly on uh, bus routes and subway routes, will now see that pushed off, that, uh, that in fact the T will be using and recommending to the control board uh, uh, the kind of level that uh, we would think of as we now have people, hopefully, uh, coming back to work, coming back to the public transit system. So, um, in light of uh, Chairman Bancori's absence, I would like to mention his 49-page omnibus bill that yes. he dubbed the Transportation New Deal, which is designed in part to incentivize people to drive less and to use transit more, to use the T more. Uh, it also includes a proposed increase in the gas tax, 12 cents over three to four years, I believe, an issue that's always of interest to AAA and many others. So I believe you have had a chance to review the Senate bill, Chairman Strauss, and are there elements in it that you can support and that you would advance uh, as part of the House agenda on transportation? Well, broad brush, one of the most significant things about Senator Boncori's bill, and he's a member of leadership in the Senate, so I, I think... Uh, it, it, it bears mentioning, is that uh, the Senate apparently has now come around to the House view from last session that we have to have revenue in order to meet the expectations of the public. So I'm excited. Uh, there'll be detailed differences, of course, between the House and Senate, but I'm excited that the Senate is now coming along to a view that uh, House members, the overwhelming more than two-thirds we're willing to stand by last session and say, we need revenue. Now, gas tax was part of our mix, it's a different proposal on the Senate side, but we also tried to balance it with uh, business charges uh, in different ways that reflect uh, not just a, a, um, a user pays approach to transportation, which has been enunciated at the federal level by the new secretary there, but I would point out, at least in the House's view, what we did last session, and we'll see where members are this session, is also a notion that the beneficiaries pay. One of the things, and I'll just focus on this, was uh, in the House pa package last session was, uh, uh, with the help of the Progressive Caucus, the uh, uh, long-standing, many, many years, uh, minimum corporate uh, fee of $300, no matter the size. You could be a billion dollar corporation, you could be a mom and pop store. So we introduced the concept and I'd love to have people debating this approach, which is uh, businesses depend on the transportation system as well, not just individuals, but our whole economic activity. And so businesses benefit when we have a reliable transportation network, all modes working together, 
available to the public, available to businesses for moving goods and services. And, and that has to be part of the discussion and we'll see where the Senate goes with that. But to your main question, uh, there's some things in the Senate uh, or in Senator Boncori's bill that uh, I think are good. There are ones I, I think are secondary, if I could be polite, but, but that's the legislative process. But clearly the good news is the Senate has decided uh, if I can describe it that way, that we have to engage in a funding part of the equation if we're really going to have the system that we need. Well, it's bound to be an interesting conversation. I want to move on down the line. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mayor McGee, you have the benefit of a dual perspective, many years in the state legislature and more than three years now as mayor of Lynn. You've long been a proponent of water transport and you co-chair the Commuter Rail Communities Coalition. Commuter Rail, as uh, Chairman Strauss just referenced, has taken a huge hit during the pandemic with so many now working from home who perhaps will plan to continue working from home. Are we seeing a gradual return to commuter rail right now? And what do you see as the major issues facing us this year and next year? Thank you for the question, Mary, and thanks to AAA for putting this together. Glad to be with my good friends, Bill and Steve. Uh, we we, uh, we have the passion for transportation uh, and continue that. So it's great to see them uh, hopefully in person one of these days soon. Uh, I think, um, uh, you know, the reality of the commuter rail system and what we're facing uh, today and, and creating a 21st century system. And, I, and I'll go to uh, what pre-pandemic was the, and probably 18 months ago, I think it was probably being discussed today at the Fiscal Management Control Board. Uh, was a reimagining, a revisioning of the commuter rail system in Massachusetts, which I fully support, which I'm uh, talking about electrification and uh, really creating a, a commuter rail system that in many ways, in, in many parts of the system could and, and will act as, as more of a rapid transit system with new equipment, electrification, and, and the kind of vision uh, and the reality of what's going on in other parts of the world, Toronto, for example, which uh, was a great presentation in front of the control board, probably just prior to the pandemic hitting. Uh, so I think we need to look at the vision and more importantly, uh, the reality that buses and transit have still been uh, used by those essential workers. Uh, and just as importantly, we're not gonna be able to expand uh, major uh, subway systems throughout the region. There's, there's no ability to take the, the takings that would be necessary. We have sitting in this region and, and a Toronto is really embracing this uh, ahead of what we're doing a commuter rail network that really can uh, can work in a much different way, uh, work, work more like a rapid transit system with frequent service, uh, you know, electric electric uh, equipment, electric vehicles, uh, you know, coming and going quickly like uh, like they do in Tokyo, where the commuter rail system is more like a, a broad and ranging subway system or the metro system in Washington, D.C. So I think what's happened during this pandemic is it's identified uh, the challenges that commuter rail faces, but just as importantly, the opportunities for a, a, a revisioned, a reimagined, and a, and a 21st century commuter rail system that hits many communities, the Fairmont Line, uh, the economic, uh, the uh, environmental justice corridor that comes up here through Lynn, uh, heading up towards uh, Salem, Beverly, and beyond. Uh, and, uh, you know, the uh, the opportunity to really take advantage of that. And, and it's not just about the line that comes through the city of Lynn, but you're talking about Haverhill and Lawrence, uh, Worcester, South Coast Rail, uh, the kind of uh, opportunities here through commuter rail that we really can see a much more robust and 21st century system. And I really believe that uh, that transit is the, the not only for today, but the reality of tomorrow. And I'll just give an example, uh, you know, from the local level. We've got uh, 251 units built across the street from the commuter rail station. Again, it's not really functional for Lynn. We, we, we see limited trains and uh, substantially high cost for that. We really need a rapid transit like system that I'm talking about here. 251 units uh, just about ready to be completely filled. 330 units a block and a half away from there with another close to a thousand units being built. Very limited car uh, opportunities for those units. We're looking at between 1,500 and 2,000 new units within three blocks of the commuter rail station in Lynn and you're seeing that in many of the gateway cities as well as uh, when this pandemic first hit and the cuts were suggested all the way down to Plymouth, uh, the transit oriented development to create the opportunities for housing that we really need in the region is the way to go. And uh, we need to do it with a system that works. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm optimistic and excited about that opportunity. And uh, I actually 
uh, put in some comments today uh, through voicemail um, in this new world we're facing to the Fiscal uh, Management Control Board to really advocate for phase one um, to start not only talking about it, but start the planning and start the implementation on, on that first phase to really start to show that these commuter rail options uh, are, are the, really the future of what we need to make investment in. Upgrade uh, transit and buses, you know, dedicated bus lanes, the last mile connections, but the, uh, the real uh, pretty robust opportunity, I believe, we, and, and I think the Fiscal Management Control Board embraced 18 months ago is something that really bodes well for us if we start to both embrace the vision, work on the reality of transit-oriented development as well as transit um, options for our region. Uh, I really feel strongly we can be a model for, for the nation. And uh, I'll just finish with this. With um, You take the Toronto plan and you plopped the Toronto system, which they're talking about. This is their vision. Uh, you, you would, if you put it on the greater Boston area, it would be from southern New Hampshire to, uh, to the Rhode Island border. And obviously, South Coast Rail would be a key piece of that. Uh, and then as, as some of the legislators are talking about east-west east -west connections out beyond Worcester, you know, that, those are, that's a real vision with, I think, a, a reality of uh, opportunity that we face. So do we need to find the money? Absolutely. I think Chairman Strauss spoke to that. And uh, I think there's a number of options that we need to look at, business, uh, you know, gas tax, um, and Steve probably will realize I'm not, a, I'm not afraid of suggesting that revenue is an important piece of the, the puzzle. Uh, a fair a bit of tolling and some legislation I had filed prior to leaving the legislature. Uh, but I think uh, one between one uh, between one dollar be spent on transportation brings two or three dollars in private investment. And as the uh, uh, a better city had stated in one of their recent reports, uh, for the two billion dollars or so we spend on the MBTA, we got. We get economic return in the greater Boston area between 13 and 14 billion dollars. So these investments that we're talking about, making, finding the revenue to make it happen for a broader vision, for a system that will work for all of us and grow our economy, uh, is is real, and we need to find a way to move it forward. A lot of great points there that you brought up, Mr. Mayor, and uh, you know we're seeing the same thing in Mansfield, Mass, near where I live, with uh, thousands of apartment units being built uh, at the end of the line of the commuter rail. So uh, definitely a phenomenon. You've talked a lot about uh, how we're going to pay for for these improvements. Um, how much will the stimulus money that's coming to Massachusetts help with transportation improvements? I think the key piece, and Chairman Strauss talked to it, that money needs to be spent now both for operation and for the capital projects that we've talked about. Uh, I'm pretty optimistic, uh, particularly with the support nationwide, over 72, 74% of the uh, polling is reflecting that people support the $1.9 trillion investment for a um, major piece of legislation that President Biden's been able to push forward. And really starting to talk about several trillion dollars in infrastructure investment that we at this on this call recognize is is a real number, and and so I'm I'm optimistic that if we're able to both parlay uh, the kind of decisions locally to find the revenue that we can uh, work with the fed with our federal partners to see the kind of investment in infrastructure and roads, bridges, and transit that that this country needs to really um, be able to uh, be the model for for working for our, to grow our economy and and ch with the challenges being you know faced in China and other places and making substantial investments. And, tr and transportation infrastructure that we need to make here. So I, I think uh, there's opportunity to take the dollars that came from the 1.9 trillion, some of the dollars that are still available from the 900 billion that was passed in December, and and then work with our federal partners to uh, to see a real a push for a, um, hopefully a bipartisan uh, efforts in D.C. to get a, a real infrastructure proposal passed that's been talked about for for too many years to not see it happen right now. Yeah, and I want to talk about that later in our discussion. Um, so thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. And before I move on to Senator Bedour, I just want to mention to our audience, please feel free to type your questions into the chat. I know we have some journalists who are with us today. 
please feel free again to type those questions into the chat and we will address those questions uh, in the uh, latter part of the program. Uh, so Senator Bedore, when we la last got this panel together, you had talked about the need for a congestion czar or a traffic czar in Massachusetts, but obviously the landscape has changed a lot over the last year, year and a half. Uh, during the pandemic, roads in fact have often been so wide open that speeding has emerged as a real hazard here in Massachusetts. It does seem that uh, traffic jams have become more commonplace in recent months and weeks. What do you think? Will we see a return to congestion with so many planning to work from home uh, more days of the week? And uh, where does that leave us with roads and bridges and those kinds of infrastructure concerns that are important to those of us who drive? Good. Mary, thank you again. And thanks to AAA for the great work you do year in and year out in terms of uh, lobbying and sort of putting transportation issues at the forefront. Um, Chairman Strauss, uh, Mayor McGee, always a pleasure to continue the dialogue. Uh, and I have to say, I agree a lot with what uh, everyone's saying today is that we are in a very unique opportunity to really transform how we deliver transportation services here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Obviously, the assumptions that were made pre-COVID, we don't know if those assumptions are true today. So as I've said in lots of different um, you know, groups and, and meetings is that I think 2021 needs to be a deep breath. There are certain issues that we absolutely need to sort of stay on top of and continue to invest in. Uh, but at the same time, we don't know what our transportation delivery system is going to look like uh, at the end of the year. So I think the idea of the chairman talking about the transportation committees coming together and working on a bipartisan or, or comprehensive transportation bill is terrific. Uh, looking at all modes of transportation, including that, is, as I always say, is for those of us who drive, uh, it's roads and bridges and congestion. And uh, obviously, coming into Boston or going into Boston now is a lot different than it was you know, pre-COVID. So do I think there's a need for a traffic czar? I do. I think it should be part of the conversation because whether we like it or not, I think you're going to see traffic come back uh, to the extent that it once was. I don't know. I, I think that's one of the areas that we really need to figure out in terms of you know, what the future will look like, but we have enough data now to look at the choke points throughout the Commonwealth and during this time frame, really come up with creative ways to hopefully sort of open up uh, those congestion points. I think it's important um, that we have this conversation and this dialogue that includes all modes uh, of transportation. And I think it's important that the T is sort of doing what they're doing today, is committing to continuing the services. It's critical during uh, this situation, the, the sort of COVID world that we live in, that we continue to allow people to get in and out of work, that they have reliable transportation, and the T is critical uh, in that process. But at the same time, we also have to remember that we need to make sure that our roads and bridges are safe, that they're funded, that we're looking at new ways in which um, we can sort of incorporate those sort of congestion um, points, sort of decreasing those congestion points should be part of that conversation. And um, I just would say, and I've said this, and you know, the, whether it's transportation or taxes, there's a whole litany of different issues that we really do need to take a collective deep breath uh, and see what the economy looks like post-COVID, once the economy opens back up. Uh, and I think that there are other states, uh, similar states, New York, California, where you're seeing a stampede of businesses leaving and heading down south to Florida, to Texas, to sort of different states. Of sort of, so we just need to be careful here in the Commonwealth, revenue should be on the table. Uh, it should be part of the conversation, um, but we shouldn't be rushing to do anything, whether it's in transportation or other areas, until we really know the full impact uh, of COVID. And I think as the process continues, that's a conversation that we should be having. I think this legislature with the leadership uh, of the two chairs, uh, Chairman Boncori, Chairman Strauss, I think they'll have that conversation. Um, and the ultimate decision will be later on in the year where we'll have a better understanding of where we are uh, as a Commonwealth and where we are as a transportation system. And by the way, I would just add that uh, with the billions of dollars coming into the Commonwealth from uh, the infrastructure bill, that's another opportunity to really sort of take into account that money coupled with the vision we have here in the Commonwealth and just reform and revamp uh, how we deliver transportation services in the Commonwealth. So from a transportation perspective, this is an exciting time. There's a lot uh, to be done. We have really, we have a lot to catch up on, uh, but at the same time, um, COVID is, is, is critical and we just, 
we can't afford to make a mistake. So I think we need to be deliberate. I think Chairman Strauss, the House, as well as the Senate will be. Um, and we just need to sort of move along in a way that uh, really presents this long term. Yeah, I think that's very true. I think much still remains to be seen. Would you, along those lines, be in favor of a congestion pilot, as we've seen uh, proposed in the past, to sort of assess where we are in terms of the needs of people in the Commonwealth and the modes of transportation that they choose post-pandemic, Senator Bedore? I think everything should be on the table. I think right now it's difficult to have a congestion model when there isn't really congestion. Um, so I think we need to have that conversation going forward. I remember debating uh, Congressman Capuano and a few others on this issue, and we talked about all we need to do is cut back 5% um, to 10% of the traffic going in and out of Boston. We've done that, clearly. Uh, we need to make sure that without looking outside of the Commonwealth, uh, there's a plenty of congestion points on 495, on 93, on 24, 140 that we should be looking at. So we need to take this from the totality of the, of the Commonwealth. Um, but I just think it's too soon to be jumping into those types of scenarios without really understanding the impact COVID will have on the future delivery of our transportation services. I, I don't know if this is when we, we start jumping in or not, uh, but I, I did want to... Uh, talk about infrastructure demands and, and uh, uh, based on some of the comments from, uh, from, from uh, both guys. Uh, people should realize not all uh, dreamed of projects are going to be eligible for uh, what everyone hopes would be additional infrastructure money from the federal government. And what I mean by that is uh, there are a lot of projects at different conceptual and near permit levels uh, around the state. And so we'll t I'll just give you a couple that are widely talked about, but are nowhere near being able to spend one dime. Uh, that would be Alston Brighton, a uh, major project of how people move east-west into and out of the city. There is no real project right now. Uh, we're at a standstill in terms of the different um, uh, competing interest groups, and in, in, uh, so to speak, in terms of anything that could be built, probably for years. Same, I, I have to add, with regard to East-West Rail. I know a lot of people uh, are, are um, infatuated with the project, but it doesn't exist. Uh, we don't even own the land. The Commonwealth doesn't, west of the city of Worcester. Uh, so if you want to start focusing on and, and this is a great public discussion that should be occurring. Where would major transportation monies be spent? Um, in my mind, and, and I, when she wore a different hat, Stephanie Pollack, when she was secretary, I think had the same view. Uh, the major project I'm aware of that is fairly far along would be the uh, uh, absolutely necessary bridges on the Cape Cod Canal that need to be replaced. But also when we talk about infrastructure uh, for transportation, we should think uh, broadly as well. Uh, Senator Mayor McGee talked about uh, electrification issues. And in terms of coming climate issues, uh, ultimately there will be a day when our uh, commuter rail system or however we want to define it uh, or label it uh, is running essentially electric. We do not have the electric capacity in Massachusetts right now to actually run the entire commuter rail system if all of a sudden today you said, there are the wires, they're all hooked up. We couldn't run an electric commuter rail system today. And so you have to think of these things in terms of the other climate issues that are going on in terms of clean power that's coming along. Uh, and we'll use the phrase loosely with the infrastructure, uh, shovel ready. There are a number of important safety uh, uh, projects. Positive train control is one, costs several hundred million dollars. It's been held up, frankly, for lack of funding resources. Those kind of things are the perfect one-time, ready-to-go uh, transportation-related projects that I think people should think of uh, because we can't uh, use the federal monies to the extent they come along uh, for things that add or, or cover operating costs. Those infrastructure expenditures 
should be necessary items. Uh, frankly, whether it's road and bridge, we'll still need those. You'll still need to be driving around uh, no matter what we've got for an adequate uh, modern public transit system. The roads and bridges are still uh, going to be necessary out there. And as I said, in these numbers that I got from MassDOT or as of uh, first half of March, we're, we're pretty much at uh, statewide uh, near 90% of where we were a year ago. So people are driving around. They are buying gas. Uh, they're just not driving around in the same ways that maybe they did a year ago. So I, I just wanted to jump in on that. No, that's true. And I certainly have seen plenty of traffic when I have ventured out. Uh, any comments from Senator Bajor or Mary McGee on what uh, Chairman Strauss just talked about? I'd like to just um, step in a little bit. I, you know, Chairman Strauss, you know, clearly understands the, the the reality of the electrification of the whole system. And I think, as I talked earlier, I think that's why the control board's um, suggestion of, you know, a proposal of a phase one uh, opportunity, which would take uh, the Providence line, which is somewhat electrified now, the Fairmont line, and then the uh, environmental justice corridor up to um, up towards Lynn Salem and Beverly as a first step towards starting to show this uh, this opportunity. I think the uh, the other piece that uh, I think has happened nationwide is is starting to take a look at uh, in, uh, interim vehicles (EMUs). So you've got opportunities to run both electric and uh, and diesel. Uh, you know those those vehicles are available in some places, so I think it's it's starting to show what we need to do, uh, get a chance to spend the, that investment where you can find the electricity to make some of this work, and and then see where that goes. And I think there's a real opportunity in the current uh, capital investment plan over the next four years to get that going and start to really show that this is this is the direction we need to go. And I, and, and Chairman Strauss is right; it all plays into the the climate uh, change. Uh, the legislation was just passed, but more importantly, what we need to do related to climate change. And, and and along this corridor, particularly in the density from uh, Boston heading up towards Salem and Beverly through Lynn, uh, diesel trains coming and going through there, uh, gridlock on the roadways, uh, buses in, in gridlock. It, it really isn't a system that's working right now. So it's an opportunity to take on both of these these challenges. And, and I just want to make a point on the uh, no question that on the roads and bridges, um, you know, the the uh, the backlog and the challenges we face continue to be there. Uh, and and just at the local level, you know, it's great to see the 200 million dollars. Uh, I think we're going to see again on Chapter 90. But being on the ground uh, in the in the city right now and seeing, uh, you know, on first hand every day the real need of and, and you know it's it's every community. It's not just Lynn. So there's so many needs across the board when we're talking about where those investments uh, ha have to be made. And and so there's no easy answers to uh, across the board solutions. That's why I think revenue is a piece of the puzzle. And then putting a plan in place that allows us to start to move um, in, a, you know, in the first and second steps towards uh, a broader regional vision uh, that, that and, and it really does include all modes of transportation, uh, including you know, bike, and, uh, bike uh, access, which uh, we're starting to see real opportunities uh, and then on the strand coming into Lynn. So all of these pieces are a part of the puzzle. And, uh, and what Steve said is it is an exciting time because we're starting to realize what we need to do to, to address these issues across the board. I'm glad you brought up the climate change bill. Uh, Mayor McGee just signed, of course, late last week by the governor. Uh, congratulations. Um, and uh, let me just ask, the bill obviously calls for many, many things, including uh, electrification of vehicles, uh, uh, enhanced and increased numbers of charging stations, et cetera. Do you think the benchmarks, Chairman Strauss, that have been set are are realistic ones, and will we be able to achieve those benchmarks in a timely fashion? I, I think they are, and I, I think uh, the fact that you had the House and Senate and the governor who had different views going into this debate uh, all come together on these targets uh, in terms of the, the climate bill is important. And, and let me point out uh, with electrification, similar kind of issue in terms of what are what are things that at first blush uh, uh, become tra you're you're not aware of are transportation issues? Actually, in the transportation bond bill, which we did at the end of last session, the governor signed it in January. I wish he'd sign more of the bill, but uh, we'll we'll hopefully get back to some of those issues later. But one of the things he did uh, uh, sign on to with that bill was, frankly, it was a Senate initiative. 
but uh, with regard to charging stations for electric vehicles, uh, it was pointed out by one of the senators who offered the, the, the amendment on their side during debate that uh, the electric rate really was that these stations access in terms of dealing with the public utilities was inhibiting the expansion of electric vehicle charging stations. So uh, what is now law is that within, I think uh, certainly before the end of June, we're gonna have some new tariff structures uh, that are required from the utilities to offer uh, more realistic uh, rates for use of the charging stations. People were being charged in effect uh, highest possible rates, no matter the time of day that they use the stations. And so that was a disincentive that made no sense to the public uh, and the expansion of uh, charging stations. So we're gonna see those things begin to play out and that will help us meet the targets in uh, the bill that the governor signed last week. Well, it's going to be interesting for sure to see, uh, you know, what happens with those deadlines and, and what we can achieve, but very exciting as well. Senator Bedore, um, I actually have an audience question specifically for you. And our audience member asks, do you include congestion management as a tool in your multimodal vision? It should be. And, and again, I think that it's a great time to have those types of conversations, so that type of um, creativity. Uh, as we move forward, it was always difficult to um, sort of drop onto the delivery system, the different models that we talked about, just because it, it, the congestion was overwhelming. For those of us who were driving into the city, it, it was not only frustrating, but at times it was just, it, it, was, it, you, it was intolerable. You just couldn't deal with the amount of delays, in part when you saw the congestion <laughs> points, right? You you saw, you knew at a certain time, no matter what time of day it was, there was going to be a traffic jam. And you could look ahead and see no cars, but for some reason, everybody stopped at a particular point. That's where I think the Commonwealth needs to step up uh, during this time frame and really uh, aggressively pursue creativity. And, and to his credit, the administrator has done that. You're seeing better signage going up throughout the Commonwealth in terms of just the ability for people to know when to merge, when not to merge, uh, taking some of the lessons from other states and incorporating them into the delivery system. You're seeing more, more markings actually on the highway. All that, I think, will make a difference as people come back. But I don't see people coming back to the degree that we once were in pre-COVID. So I think we have to be careful as we move forward. We don't want to sort of go too aggressive, whether it's on revenues or on reforms or changes or on investments until we really have that solid understanding. The Fed's just pumped in 2.4 billion to RTAs and to the MBTA. The, the, the financial side will be there, I think initially. I think that's a longer term question that the legislature should begin to have. And I know Chairman Strauss has said it time and time again, they will have that conversation. So that's a good thing. Um, I just think I would just caution that the uh, the economy is still um, not it's 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 shaky right now, and we have to be careful that we don't implement additional sort of policies that will get CEOs and others thinking twice about whether they um, whether they move, whether they stay, whether they increase employment here or elsewhere. So I think we need to take that all into effect, and by doing so, I think if we put together a comprehensive transportation plan that includes all of the things that Chairman Strauss and, and Chairman McGee, Mayor McGee are talking about, including having that revenue conversation. I think the business community looks at Massachusetts as what we always are. We're always ahead of the curve. We're thoughtful. We put together um, uh, bills and laws and plans that actually make sense for the long term. So that's why I think coming out of COVID, we just need to be careful uh, and we need to be deliberate and we need to be inclusive and transparent and just make sure that uh, one, we don't make anything anything worse, but at the same time, our goal should be to make it better. So you all have sparked a, a, quite a few questions. I've got a, a pile of audience questions here, but one thing I want to make sure we touch on before I get to those questions in a moment is the issue of transportation equity, which is so important right now and is really emerging as such a vital part of the conversation. So Chairman Strauss, all of you, Mayor McGee, Steve, um, if you can all comment on what you think the priorities are, uh, and what you're considering most strongly in terms of issues of equity right now, that would be great. Chairman Strauss, you want to start? Sure. Uh, and and I do that based on 
and, and it's one of the things about the legislature that, that makes it work well, which is uh, the diversity of the membership, the, of the members of the legislature itself. My district includes the city of New Bedford, which is uh, always uh, regrettably had uh, real challenges compared to other parts of the state. So this issue of equity is front and center uh, in my region of the state every day. And, and I know Mayor McGee deals with that uh, up in his region. And, and we all have these uh, parts of the state that uh, uh, have to be uh, the subject of, of special attention. And so when that uh, comes up in the area of transportation, you focus uh, quite rightly on the modes so that when we talk about equity in public transit, we also have to remember that uh, a lot of people, and this is true in my region, who uh, uh, are facing tough economic times, they rely on their cars. Uh, so the transportation uh, uh, improvements that we provide, and this is front and center with the legislature, uh, have to recognize the different ways in which the transportation system is accessed so that uh, transportation doesn't uh, determine an outcome but makes something possible uh, and that is access to uh, the good roads good bridges the expanding uh, rail system uh, we're seeing that benefit and, and many thanks frankly to the baker administration to the governor himself uh, for uh, recognizing that deficiency, which we've been waiting for for decades in, in my region of the state and, and stepping forward on that. Uh, so the equity issue has to focus on all modes, not just uh, particular ones. And, and that's, that's what I hear from my colleagues. So that, again, obviously there's uh, uh, always going to be a focus on the MBTA, but the other parts of the state for public transit that depend on the regional transit authorities, we cannot lose sight of, of how they uh, provide access to the economy for jobs, medical care, whatever, uh, to their populations. So that's the broad uh, lens or the, yeah, the broad lens that we use in, in focusing this debate. And then it comes to the, um, the bills themselves. And um, so that's always the challenge. It's why uh, as Mayor McGee used to say when we co-chaired it, and it's still a line that I quote him often, every year is transportation year in the legislature. Very true. Very true. Yeah, can I just jump in? Because I think, um, first of all, the mayor is correct. That is a, it is every year. It should be transportation year. Uh, but I think Chairman Strauss hit it right, right on the head. It, it's exactly where we need to be focusing across the Commonwealth. Uh, the RTA sometimes are sort of... Uh, they're the sort of forgotten child sometimes in, in this discussion, and they play such a critical role outside of the city of Boston, whether it's in Western Mass, Merrimack Valley, North Shore, Southeastern Mass. So um, I think more attention as we move forward and come up with this new delivery system should be looking at ways in which we can expand, uh, whether it's um, individual ridership, if we have to change a little bit of that focus in terms of instead of having the big bus with one or two people in it, we have a smaller, um, smaller ride shares, whatever it might be, but there's opportunities there that we need to take advantage of. And the RTAs play a critical role uh, in how we deliver uh, that equity piece going forward in all regions of Commonwealth. Very true. Mayor McGee, anything you want to add on this issue? Uh, it's clearly, I, uh, as uh, Chairman Strauss and, uh, and uh, Senator Bador talked about it, it, it needs to be at the forefront and it is it isn't, you know, when you sit it, when you're living in a city like Lynn and we're seeing the, the real impact of, um, you know, lack of, of, of affordable and frequent service, uh, buses that are, that are jammed, uh, congestion in our area that really doesn't lend itself to people getting around easily and an inability in a lot of places for people actually have cars. So it, it, it really is impact. And then, and then with COVID, uh, with this COVID-19 and, and Lynn and Everett, Revere, Chelsea, were probably, if not the hardest hit at least region in the Commonwealth, with a couple of other gateway cities, Lawrence in particular, uh, with completely uh, devastating uh, impact uh, during this, which reflects back on the equity. And, and Steve's right. The uh, you know, there's if you look at the regional, and I don't have the numbers in my head, but you know, the regional transit authorities, most most of those uh, riders are really lower income riders trying to get to work that don't have any other access to their jobs. So 
the equity and, and making some uh, a system that works and that's um, safe, frequent, affordable, and clean is something that really it needs to be a goal and, and because it really impacts so many communities in a negative way and, and people that can't uh, otherwise either get around or they're forced to have, uh, you know, um, diesel trains and, and uh, buses coming and going through their neighborhoods and, and the, uh, the pollution that comes from those vehicles is a health impact as much as anything else. So it's, um, I think we all understand how important equity is uh, and, and the equity, making sure the equity is, is addressed really makes it a better place for all of us. Absolutely. So let's move to our uh, audience questions. And uh, our first question actually uh, deals with VMT. Uh, the new transportation secretary, Pete Buttigieg, said a vehicle mileage tax could be on the table in infrastructure talks. What are your thoughts on this? Who wants to jump in first? Chairman Strauss? Well, I think uh, the the vehicle miles traveled, which uh, has suffered from uh, probably a, a, a bad series of uh, letters. It's often called the vomit tax. Uh, so people have a hostility right there. Uh, but in all seriousness, uh, what I think has held it up is the notion that uh, because so much of the traffic, not just within the private travel, but is interstate travel, through a state like Massachusetts uh, uh, means that uh, you don't have a fair way to distribute it. So up until uh, uh, the Biden administration, I think things had been uh, uh, at least bogged down on, on examining as a ultimate replacement for the gas tax, which is really a proxy for miles traveled under historic technology of automobile, uh, gasoline and diesel vehicles. Uh, but as we switch to electric, and this is what I was thinking of when I mentioned the new secretary uh, earlier today, uh, we still have the notion that use of the roads requires uh, uh, payment, frankly, and, and that's what the gas tax reflects. But as we look ahead, probably 10 to 20 years, uh, we'll have a different system of vehicle fleet, a different mix with many more electric vehicles, but still a need to take care of the system. If you have a national system, you deal with that immediate problem of uh, when somebody travels through multiple states or they live here year round, but travel, maybe they're in, in the southern part of the country during the winter. We can't just look at their odometer and send them a bill uh, if you want to implement a vehicle miles traveled system without in some way allocating it back through the entire system. So it's probably an idea that fits better uh, in terms of an interstate model if it comes. I think that's been some of the resistance. There are privacy concerns, of course, uh, whether you're tracking vehicles and the government is keeping track of where they are. You have to get around those issues. Uh, so what I predict from the, the meetings I've attended is you're more likely to see an interstate vehicle miles traveled system in the commercial fleet area first. Uh, and that's an easier system to track. Uh, those commercial vehicles already are often used to having some sort of transponders in them and they can reallocate the, the charges back to the states where the vehicles traveled. So I see that coming on the commercial level if it does. I also see it more on the national level if it does. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, other comments? Steve, Mayor McGee on VMT? Uh, Steve, do you want to go? No, I was, I was just saying, I think the chairman hit it right. They would, that's perfect. I think that's the right approach looking at it from a national perspective. It's difficult to do it state by state difficult to sort of have that um, your vehicle sort of tracked as well as paying the gas tax you don't want to get double hit either so there's a lot of questions a lot of potential opportunities as well uh, taking from a national perspective to me makes a lot of sense mr. mayor a couple, couple of quick points I think we we weren't able to get over the finish line a pilot program just to kind of identify how it would work a couple of states are doing that I think that is at least an option amount a voluntary pilot program 
Uh, but I, you know, my last piece of legislation before I actually ran for mayor was looking at a more broader based tolling system because I think um, Jim Estrus laid out the challenges on BMT, particularly with a lot of uh, interstate travel coming and going. Um, you know, with with the uh, electronic tolling and the opportunities uh, that you could really you can really shape a, a plan uh, for you know people that are working five days a week. You know, you, you could really set a system up that identifies certain cr criteria and parameters on a on a robust you know fair uh, tolling system as a piece of the puzzle for for um, what we need to do for revenue. So I think a national VMT makes sense. And I think we need to continue to look at an opportunity. Uh, you know, we have limited tolling, but there's areas in the state that get tolled, most don't. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I propose and continue to think, taking a look at a broader based, fair and, and reasonable tolling system that takes into account so many different pieces of the puzzle, which, which you can do now with all electronic tolling and the kind of technology that's available. So there's, and again, I think the, the, the real discussion needs to be what are the number of different pieces of revenue that we can fairly uh, implement that get us the dollars we need, but also uh, would be embraced by both the legislature and the public. And uh, particularly on the toll, I'll go back to the tolling and use it for all modes of transportation. Uh, one of the bill that I proposed would create, you know, um, you know, an ability to bond billions of dollars a year. Uh, with the revenues that were coming in with the payback, which would allow us to really make some major investments across the board, um, you know, roads, bridges, transit, local roads and bridges that that still need that kind of investment. So it's, I think it's a, it's part of the discussion. The legislation will continue on, and I'll just leave one final point because I think on the on the gas tax, I'll speak for myself. I thought we really missed the boat uh, when we went three cents uh, when I was in when I was chair of the committee. And if we had gone to nine cents, we would have got to the point where inflation from uh 1991 to i think it was 2012 or 13 keep me honest here bill uh, when we passed that that legislation but nine cents on the gallon was close to 350 million dollars a year that we had lost just by inflation so uh we, we really have to have an honest discussion about what are the fair ways to find revenue but i think it has to be a number of a number of uh, options that uh people would uh w that we can all embrace together and AAA supported that gas tax measure, uh, as you recall, along with the indexing of the uh, tax to inflation. I want to move on to another question, this one regarding the role of employers uh, in transportation issues. Last year, as part of the Globe Spotlight series on traffic, they highlighted the incentives employers offer, such as free parking that increase congestion. What role should employers play in reducing traffic and promotions and in promoting alternative modes of travel? New Jersey, for example, requires employers of 20 or more to offer pre-tax transit benefits to employees, which cost nothing or little to the employers themselves. The Boston City Council has also offered a similar ordinance. Should this be considered statewide? And again, we, this is an audience question uh, put to you. Senator Bedore, do you want to start? Well, I, I think a lot of employees are already doing that. Uh, and they're incentivizing um, those types of activities. Again, um, in the world that we live in today, I think we need to be very careful in additional mandates on employers as they're coming out of sort of COVID-19. There has been and continued, Massachusetts is a high cost state to begin with. I understand that there's a lot we need to do and we can do it a lot better, uh, but at the same time, we need to be um, realistic in terms of how we're competing with other states. So at the same time, congestion, we need to address it, uh, but we can't put everything on the backs of our uh, employers here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. At the same time though, we need to do our homework. Let's make sure we get it right, that we get through this sort of post uh, COVID, um, sort of this, just the situation that we're in right now. Let's focus on uh, the economy, on bringing jobs back, getting Massachusetts where we were pre-COVID. Uh, and then if we have to have those conversations, those conversations can be part of that discussion. I think if we act too quickly, uh, whether we tax too much, put too much on employers, continue down this road, I think you're gonna see a lot of employers looking um, to those states down south and saying, it just, we, we live in a world now where people can work from home. There's not necessarily this need. The Boston Globe, I think, in an editorial a few weeks ago, uh, so, you know, things have suddenly changed and we have to be careful as we move forward. Uh, and that change is that fact that people are working from home uh, and that employers can move around uh, the country uh, a lot easier than they did in years past. So we never knew it was going to work. So I would just caution 
uh, that we need to be careful as, as we sort of move forward here. Take 2021 to really get a feel and an understanding as to how COVID's impacted the delivery system and how we're going to come out of it so that we can build that new modern creative sort of the, the delivery system that we've talked about uh, for decades here in Massachusetts. And this gives us the opportunity to do so. And we need to take full advantage of that. Thank you, Senator. Other comments? Chairman Strauss, Mr. Mayor? The, the, the only thing I would add to that is um, that kind of fine tuning idea of the, the parking incentive. Um, I tend to agree with uh, former Senator Bedour. Uh, we're about to see, and I don't think we'll all know exactly on the same measurements when we get there, but we're about to see a transition in terms of work patterns that uh, I don't think any of us are smart enough to, to, to see for sure what it's going to look like. Uh, as I said, we're, we're seeing people driving around. Uh, they're driving around in, uh, there is no uh, single peak congestion period. It's more spread out. So that's changed maybe uh, long-term, the congestion issue. But we're also seeing part of the, con the, the amount of driving that's going on right now, frankly, is because people are not yet comfortable returning to the public transit modes, uh, the bus and subway and commuter rail numbers that they did before. Will they go back? Will they go back five days a week? Uh, we're, we're still waiting to find out. Uh, we're also going to see an emphasis, and it, it was not uh, intended neglect on my part, in terms of other alternative transportation uh, methods. Um, we have a, a, a lot of activity on, on uh, bikeways down here in my region. And I know in other parts of the state, and that's going to affect some, some, you know, particularly in the cities, and especially in Boston, some real development questions that I think the new mayor is going to have to uh, deal with, uh, where access to the lanes is going to be a big issue, the travel ways on the roads in a congested city area. Uh, parking systems in, in uh, city neighborhoods, uh, there's a lot of travel area that is dedicated traditionally to parking, and there's going to be some local debates, municipal and statewide, about those valuable travel lanes because there's going to be competition. Uh, we're going to see an increase, I think, shortly in terms of uh, the transportation, the network vehicles, the, the Uber and Lyfts, uh, that's going to reignite that discussion. So. Uh, we do have to be cautious, I think, for several more months that some of the trends we're seeing uh, may be just part of the transition back to whatever the recovery ultimately looks like in, in, in an economic standpoint. Uh, but I do think ultimately, and, and I didn't mean to neglect uh, air travel either, uh, we have a jewel in this state in, in uh, uh, Logan Airport, which has tied us in to international markets, and I fully expect that to reinflate. Uh, and they have uh, expansion ideas that they had put on hold during this uh, period. So uh, we want to reconnect to the, the uh, international travel system. I don't think those are things we want to give up. Uh, and I think, with all respect to former Senator Bedour, uh, our connection to international markets and where we are uh, looking east and looking west uh, that's not going to change, and, and we cannot neglect, uh, nor should we neglect the funding that's necessary to back up uh, that part of our economy. So I know we're coming to the end of our hour, but over the years, I have worked with each of you on traffic safety issues, and so I need to end with a traffic safety question because we're all about traffic safety at AAA, as you know. Worked with Senator Bedore on the texting ban, uh, Chairman Strauss. Uh, Senator McGee worked with you on seatbelts uh, over the years, as well as many discussions on seatbelts on school buses with, uh, with then Senator McGee. So real quickly, I would love you to weigh in on this uh, last audience question. In the past year, in spite of pandemic related reduced traffic volumes, we have seen increased deaths on our roadways. What steps should be taken to reverse this increase? So if I can just ask each of you to weigh in briefly on this, although certainly it's such an important issue. Mayor McGee, do you wanna start? Sure, I'll, uh, I'll start on the micro level, I guess, because um, I've been around the city for the most part and I've actually the last couple of years taken to biking uh, a lot uh, and uh, been really excited to see the Northern Strand uh, coming into Lynn, which is a dedicated over the commuter rail um, bike lanes. 
Uh, but we did a pilot over the last, actually within the last year to create bike lanes in the streets, you know, pilot, you know, lining the streets. So I've been out biking and, and the speed with which cars are zooming around the city, it's, it's unbelievable. And you don't realize it until you're on a bike and a, and a car goes by and you got to be about 50 miles an hour in a two lane. I'm just talking about certain areas in our community. Uh, but by putting these lanes in, what we've also noticed is by narrowing the lanes and grabbing what Chairman Strauss was talking about, some of these parking areas and putting in actual bike lanes. And if you said four or five years ago you'd bike around Lynn, everybody would think you're crazy because it's uh, narrow streets, a lot of cars. But it has slowed down the traffic in, in those areas. Where, so, and, it, and, and in some ways, it's actually improved the flow of traffic, which people wouldn't believe. So it, it really is a problem. Uh, but I think there's there's also an opportunity to uh, to rethink how we do it on the and I'm saying just on a local level what we can do on our streets to ensure that the flow goes as well or better but you're not going at 35 40 50 miles an hour on city streets I know on the highways with less cars on the roads there's um, you know I've been on the highways as well with cars going well beyond what they should be doing but uh, I, I can see there's an opportunity here to understand that we need to make sure that the roadways are safe for everyone Absolutely. For everyone, as you say, including cyclists, pedestrians, uh, et cetera. And I know we're going to be talking about those issues in the upcoming uh, legislative session. Uh, Senator Bedore, I'll give you a last word on traffic safety because I know it was a priority for you when you were in the legislature. No, it, it was. It continues to be. Uh, I agree with what uh, Mayor McGee talked about. I think we need to continue to better educate drivers as we come out of COVID and congestion begins to come back. Uh, that you know, speed kills. And just to go back to the basics uh, on a lot of this. So better signage, more signage, uh, more law enforcement. Get uh, you know, state police, local law enforcement out there uh, addressing some of these speed issues and, and dangerousness, uh, danger areas. You know, on the roadways, whether it's local or on the state perspective. So it needs to be a, um, a concerted effort by all sides, including those who are behind the wheel. Uh, you know, slow down a little bit. You know, realize that things can happen quickly on those roadways, and that you just got to be smart and, uh, and 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 be more thoughtful when you're on the road. I do want to just say to Chairman Strauss's point, uh, I completely agree that we need investments, uh, and we're going to continue to make those investments as we move forward in our transportation delivery system. I just want to make sure that they're the right investments on the areas that post-COVID show us that's where the investments need to be. But I think everyone agrees that. Uh, we uh, have underfunded, under um, sort of delivered in our transportation system. And that's why to me, this is such an exciting time to be part of the transportation network because you really can build a system that uh, invests in the right areas that sort of addresses the inequality issues, that addresses you know, your, your MBTA funding sources, the capital improvement uh, side of it all, as well as ensuring that there are those people in the Commonwealth who don't have access to uh, the MBTA or commuter rail or subway, you know, have the ability to get from point A to point B safely, uh, but also in a timely manner. And that's where I hope we go uh, over the next sort of nine months. And I know with the leadership of Chairman Strauss, Chairman Boncari, um, Senator McGee is always will be involved in this and uh, unquestionably AAA uh, in your involvement in this has always been just terrific. It's, it's sort of, you are sort of, I think all of us lean to uh, when it comes to a lot of these issues. So again, thank you, you know, for doing this and thanks to, to Chairman Strauss and uh, Mayor McGee for uh, their involvement and their commitments in transportation. Thank you, Senator. And Chairman Strauss, I'll give you the last word. What about safety? Well, of course, we had uh, a long time coming, uh, but at least it, it's, it's in the law. Uh, a year ago, just before COVID hit, uh, we got a hands-free requirement statewide in Massachusetts um, and then all the other traffic impacts. Uh, so I'm uh, hopeful that when traffic volumes return throughout the day in all regions of the state, that will have a significant impact on uh, just horrible tragedies that used to occur. But there are other traffic safety issues uh, to, to be addressed. And uh, so I think that when we see increased use of things like e-bikes and, and the other kinds of electronic enhanced uh, vehicles that are showing up in, in uh, the cities and some of the suburban areas. Uh, I've been advocating to make sure we have the kind of safety equipment 
terms of lights and horns and signals and, and, and braking structure, uh, so that those things uh, can can be controlled. But the safety issue really, and, and uh, I, I know both myself and Mayor McGee have talked about it, this is going to involve some really hard discussions about who has access to what parts of the travel ways that we have. Uh, where are vehicles going that we think of now, cars and trucks? Uh, where will pedestrians be? Uh, they're part of this uh, safety issue as well. Do they uh, share uh, intersection crosswalks with other vehicles? That's uh, not as uh, high profile an issue, but who has access to which parts of the roadways in the more built out areas of the suburban and, and city neighborhoods, I think will have a big, big impact on the safety issue going forward. Absolutely. You know, we all agreed at the beginning of this discussion that this hour was going to zip by, and it really has. We are over our time, but this has been a really great discussion. And I just want to thank our audience for all of your great questions and would like to thank our speakers, all of you, for your insights and your time today. I look forward to our next discussion. We could easily talk for another hour or two about all of these many issues, but it is such an exciting time in transportation in the Commonwealth, for sure, and you've demonstrated that in your comments today. A shout out to my colleague, Mark Shieldrop, for his great work behind the scenes today. And whatever your mode of travel, please be safe. And if you're driving, buckle up. For AAA Northeast, I'm Mary McGuire. Have a great day, everyone, and thank you to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you.